Welcome to the series for small group meetings titled Inspired by Grace. I'm Bishop John W. Hansen, and in these sessions, we'll celebrate the grace of God and how it empowers us and involves us in the eternal work of God's kingdom. Now, in each of these 12 lessons of the series, I'll begin with a focus story that introduces the topic for that session. Now, after the listening to that focus, small group leaders will be encouraged to lead their group in discussion, prayer, worship, things like that for a few minutes. And then we'll present the main points of the session so each group can again have time to discuss the topic, pray, and minister to one another. I'm believing for anointed conversations, prayer, times of worship, just good times of fellowship as we learn to get God's grace into our lives and let it inspire us. Lesson one is called free to live. Those three words describe the life of people who give their lives wholeheartedly to God. Freely we receive, freely we give. By grace, believers are freed from sin. They're they're freed from fear. They're freed from shame and so many other evils. So as our focus today, I'm asking you to consider this analogy. She paces in her cage, tripping over her two newborn cubs that she recently birthed as a result of artificial insemination. Each day, thousands of people file by this beautiful 350-pound Siberian tiger. A piece of raw meat lays untouched near the small iron gate through which her keepers had recently thrust it. Elaborate scenery, including the playthings they had provided, decorate that quarter-acre enclosure. Everything was state-of-the-art as far as zoos are concerned. So why the pacing, someone might ask. She has food. Water, company, safety. This must really be the good life. How come she's paced so much that she's worn a path around the perimeter of her pen? Well, the answer is obvious. She paces because everything about her life is unnatural. She was born to be free. She was born to run, fight, survive. She was engineered to expend energy. Her body wants to experience episodes of elevated blood pressure and adrenaline rushes. She's designed to mate and hunt for her young. In the zoo, she's alive, but not really living. Ironically, all the provision and all the comfort provided her by the zoo diminishes her life since she's not forced to survive in her native environment. Because everything's provided for her, you might think she'd just sit back and enjoy life. But instead, she wears a path near the perimeter wall that holds her captive, eyeing the door in case it might be left ajar. She has a deep longing to be free. Sometimes people feel similar restlessness. They may have the comforts of life, but they're lacking purpose and meaning for which they're created. They may be playing the games society invents, but they long for the supernatural encounters in which they strain and struggle, but in which they also grow and overcome. Many people think of sin as things that we do that we're not supposed to do. It's often viewed as the forbidden fruit. But Scripture describes sin as a cage that holds us captive. Sin can sometimes provide counterfeits for the important important things in life, but sin cheapens and tangles and squeezes the life out of its victims. Often people who seem to have everything wander through life looking for meaning, so frustrated that they sometimes despair of life itself. And the good news is that the door to the cage has been left ajar. Jesus Christ paid the price to make it possible for anyone to leave their cage and live free. And those who follow him can live free from sin, guilt, and shame. They can live a life of purpose as they look forward to an eternal life that will follow. Their free life will not be easy. 
but it will be the kind of life they were designed to live. The door to freedom is open. It only takes one commitment for someone to be ushered into a life that's truly free. As your leader pauses this video, take a few minutes to talk and pray about the freedom that God makes available to all mankind. We all want to live free, abundant lives, but how does that look? Before we answer that question, allow me to remind you that sometimes we look for solutions that are right under our nose. In the 1950s, the pollster George Gallup conducted interviews with 402 Americans and 128 Britons who lived to be 95 years and older. He called these people the oldsters. He published the results of this in his book called The Secrets of a Long Life. Here's just a few of the things that Gallup discovered. Respondents had jobs that required them to be physically active. 90% of the men had jobs in which they were on their feet most of the time. 71% of the men and 61% of the women reported doing hard physical labor. Their exercise came from their work. 62% of them worked outdoors. And they lived in a time when there was little processed food. They tended to eat plain cooking in moderate amounts, meat, potatoes, white bread, and most days dessert. And they regularly used butter. Almost none of them tried to go on a diet. They were deep sleepers, early risers, typically waking up at 6 a.m., they worried very little. Most of them described themselves as cheery people who would take things as they come. They reported happy overall lives. Their main interest outside work was their family and friends. They laughed a lot. And most weren't intentionally trying to live long lives. They didn't have luxurious lifestyles but they were far enough away from poverty, they didn't worry about money either. And they lived everywhere, large cities, small towns, villages, rural areas. What's interesting is half of these men never took a vacation during their entire working years. The group's median retirement age was 80 for men and 70 for women. For men, the median number of hours they worked per week was 60, for women who worked outside the home, the meeting was 64 hours a week. 93% of the men and 85% of the women reported getting a great deal of satisfaction from their work. The majority of the men and women reported having a great deal of fun at work. So one conclusion that we might draw is that our health and fitness is probably more tied to purpose than it is the fad diets and gym memberships. One secret to a long and full life, according to the study, is likely related to meaningful work and productivity. Paul shares some life coaching advice in the book of Ephesians. We'll be referring to his advice throughout this entire series. We'll be reading from the message paraphrase, which is a paraphrase, so you can get an everyday flavor of the book. You might want to read the book in other versions during your own personal time or serious study. But today, as we, being, we start exploring how grace should inspire our lives, we're going to look at the first 10 verses of that book. Ephesians 1, I, Paul, am under God's plan as an apostle, a special agent of Christ Jesus, writing to you faithful believers in Ephesus. I greet you with the grace and peace poured out into our lives by God our Father and our Master, Jesus Christ. See where he starts? Grace and peace are poured into us. God is the source. So the pressure's off of us. Then he goes on in verse 3. How blessed is God, 
And what a blessing he is. He's the father of our master, Jesus Christ, and takes us to the high places of blessing in him. Long before he laid down earth's foundation, he had us in mind, had settled on us as the focus of his love to be made whole and holy by his love. Long, long ago, he decided to adopt us into his family through Jesus Christ. What pleasure he took in planning this. He wanted us to enter into the celebration of his lavish gift giving by the hand of his beloved son. Are you getting this? God made the world with us in mind. He took pleasure in planning this. He wanted someone to love, but who could choose to receive the love and to love him back. In other words, he designed it so that we complete him. God personally robed himself in flesh, dwelt among us, lived in a body that we refer to as the Son of God. But all the fullness of the Godhead dwelt in that virgin-born Son. He died so he could redeem us and live in our hearts. So he could love us and we could love him back and then love others. This is good news. This is really the best news ever. Let's look at the last three verses of this section of Scripture Verse 7, because of the sacrifice of the Messiah, his blood poured out on the altar of the cross, we're free people, free of penalties and punishments chalked up by all our misdeeds. So, let's state the gospel in a nutshell. God came as a man, sacrificed his life to set us free so we could enter into his family. We embrace that salvation by believing, dying to our old life, being buried with him in baptism, and being open enough to him that he can fill us with his spirit that's evidenced by speaking in other tongues. That's called the new birth. And this new birth ushers us into his family and into his free world. But we're not just barely free. We are abundantly free. What would you say if you met a man who was in handcuffs and he told you that he'd been set free from prison? Would you consider him truly free? I wonder if anything's binding you or me. If so, something's wrong. God sets us free, but the enemy talks us into wearing handcuffs. Submission to God and his body are for our benefit. We obey God and the church helps us stay honest and Helps us to hear him accurately. In this way, grace keeps us from doing the things that lead us to bondage. It helps us to recognize areas we could be more free. A self-deception and iniquity are our biggest enemies. Verse 8 says, God thought of everything, provided for everything we could possibly need. Letting us in on the plans he took such delight in making. He set it all out before us in Christ, a long-range plan in which everything would be brought together and summed up in him, everything in deepest heaven, everything on planet earth. This is an incredible perspective of life. Living God's way is the ultimate life. It's cooperating with God's grand plan. The reason the devil is so scary is because he sneakily tries to convince people to give into peer pressure or to the desires of their flesh and forfeit an abundant and free life. He swindles people out of grace. He steals their love and joy. But those who get wise to his devices can live in grace, love, and joy. As we close this first session, I hope you'll take time to help one another embrace this grace-inspired life.